Hello everyone, uh, I'm Venkat Pulsani, I'm one of the cardiologists here at Piedmont Atlanta. I direct cardiovascular MRI and CTA. I just wanted to quickly talk about this uh, presentation on uh, workup of iatric stenosis patient and focus on CTA. I want to not show any guidelines, keep it very clinical. These are questions I get every day from different physicians or patients. How would you kind of, what kind of imaging would you do on a certain situation in iatric valve stenosis? So here you can see this three different pictures, volume rendered images of what CT can show. That's the, called the stalactites and stalagmites of uh, iatric valve calcification. And goals of this presentation, use of CT in diagnosis of severity of iatric stenosis. How does iatric valve calcium score uh, help us? And use of CT, you know, tavern of native valve has We've kind of gone beyond it. We are doing TAVR in bioprosthetic valve, valve in valve. How do we assess these bioprosthetic valves apart from physiology of gradients using CT? And use of, can TAVR be, CT be a one-stop shop for everything? You don't have to do, you know, when I started reading TAVR imaging 10 years ago, we were doing ultrasound for carotids, some other tests for something else, femorals. Can TAVR CT be one test that gives all the information? Can you assess the coronaries on TAVR CT with the new generation of CT scanners that are uh, around after an echo being done on a patient and you diagnose severe AS? And TAVR procedure planning. This is how CT started in TAVR utilization. The first Medtronic trial in prohibitive patients started using TAVR CT as the planning case. And this is a great example of how imaging needs to be used and data points need to be collected in the long run. So role of iatric valve calcium score. You know, Agassin score has been around for a long time, and there is a certain way of acquiring this image, and there is, uh, we acquired it 120 kilowatts and at voltage, and it needs to be a three millimeter slice for us to give a correct Agassin score of the valve. And that's the reason I bring up this question. It depends on the lab and who acquired the image. They may have acquired at a lower KB, you get a high score. I can make that calcium score less by acquiring at 140 KB. So it, it, it needs to be the right acquisition for us to say that calcium score is what's being used for calculating the valve score. Valve calcium, just like coronary calcium score, can be calculated by circling and getting the numbers of the uh, iotic valve itself. Here in this patient, the valve calcium score is about 2026. Uh, and these are the thresholds that have come up based on, the data is based on multi-center observational studies, majority of them. And the thresholds that have been associated with very likely severe iatric stenosis, the best threshold for women is about 1300. And best threshold, th these are the guideline numbers that this is where they come from. Uh, and for men, about 2,000, where, where the, these thresholds come from. And you know, not only the severity of iatric val valve calcium score is associated with severity of iatric stenosis, it has independent prognostic value. Patients who have severe iatric stenosis, this goes to the point of physiology and anatomy we deal with in coronary artery disease. <laughs> you have to combine the data from valve uh, anatomy with the physiology of how gradients are before you say it's, uh, you s tell a patient they can come back and see you later on. And Minka, this is for bicuspid or trileaflet. It's a, immaterial, is that right? Uh, or is it based on trileaflet so CTs? It is based on trileaflet CTs. The bicuspids degenerate faster. Sure. Majority of the multicenter observational data, the original data, the, uh, Serrano's paper I'll show here in a minute, is based on bicuspid okay. uh, trileaflet tri tri patients. Tri okay. Yes. AV, this is an example of a patient who is 77 year old and basically has discordance in gradients like Swami was showing. Mean gradient of 21, valve area of 0.9, Vmax of three. How would you do, uh, treat this patient with a stroke volume index of 26? You, you have an LV systolic function, that's good. So it's a low flow, low gradient, severe AS with uh, preserved EF but see the end diastolic volume of this ventricle, it's 52. You cannot expect this person to have normal flow. If you optimize, if you normalize this flow, you will have severe AS. So calculation of AS by echo 
is under normalized flow conditions, not under low flow or very high flow conditions. So you have to assume, uh, look at that too. And that's the aortic valve and the CT of that patient. And this, uh, this patient also has concomitant mitral stenosis that's accounting with severe tricuspid regurgitation, that's accounting for the low flow across the LBOT BTI. And the valve score on this patient was 203, and she kind of falls into severe aortic uh, stenosis likely situation basically. And she ended up actually getting TABR before. This was the, one of the first multi-center database that published this data. It's a three academic center database on 794 patients from uh, Mayo from Serrano. And this is where the original data of this cutoff values comes from for prognosis and not only association of severe aortic stenosis. So the, this aortic valve calcium score probably has a huge importance within our system. We do it regularly across all of our labs, and it's ordered as a simple CBCT valve calcium score. It's a non-contrast scan. You don't need contrast, and you don't need an IV. You get a quick scan, and it can be a corroborative finding along with your echocardiogram to kind of assess severity of aortic stenosis. And based on some of this data, it has a two-way recommendation in low flow, low gradient severe areas with preserved EF or low EF with low stroke volume index. You have to suspect this, and you, you can use it as a test, basically. The next question I often get is this continuum of um, bioprosthetic valves that have been there for some time, and they have degenerated, or tower valves that have had high gradients on echocardiogram. How would you interpret that? Uh, what would you do? What, how would CT help in this situation? Is it patient processes mismatch? What is the pathology that's causing this uh, leaflets to uh, uh, be restricted? Here I, see, I show you four cases. Top left is a normal bioprosthetic valve with normal leaflet excursion with no thrombosis. Top right is, I don't know if I can point this here top right is the leaflet that's restricted and thickened, if everybody can see that. And top bottom left is somebody who has severe halt, hypotenuting leaflet thrombosis. And bot bottom right is where you can see severe degeneration of a bioprosthetic valve. When you have high gradients in a bioprosthetic valve, where the anatomy is very tough to see, you got a question on an echo, on a B mode echo, you have high gradients. The next step could be a CT to assess why. Is it a patient process mismatch, or is this a path pathological finding of fault? And you, the original paper from Raj Makar's group in uh, Taber Valves was published. This is where the halt theory came about. There is a lot more publications on this since then, and we have learned a lot. Anticoagulation sometimes helps, sometimes doesn't help. Based on the data, it's not helpful. So it depends on early thrombosis of the valve or late thrombosis. So apart from looking at a graph and an echo, you could ask a question, is patient processes mismatched because of a small valve in a large root, or is there a pathology in this patient? The other question that comes up is assessing a mechanical valve thrombosis. I know this is more of a percutaneous talk, but this is a good example of a mechanical valve. On the left side, you can see the dark spot on it is the thrombus that's hindering the uh, opening of the valve. And bioprosthetic valve endocarditis by CT, you can see clearly those three le large lesions. If there is a paravalvular leak, you can see, uh, you can uh, continuity of contrast would show it. So these are all different things that you could see CT anatomically. You can measure the high gradient of a mechanical valve on an echo, but due to, uh, you have inability to see any pathology, you can do the CT to kind of assess valve uh, anatomy. The next one, this is of a lot of interest to me, coronary artery assessment. I think we probably have the highest uh, experience of the, giving nitro to patients with aortic stenosis. It's usually not recommended to give nitro to aortic stenosis patients before you do CTA. But in our lab, we do, after selecting certain patients, we give nitroglycerin and assess their coronaries along with the TAVR uh, planning. And this data actually will, the safety of giving nitro 
and comparing it with physiology of measuring FFR will be presented very soon at TCT. This is an example of a case on, a, uh, on one of our regular patients that we do Tavers CT here. And you can see uh, on the top are the angiograms, but the coronary CTA uh, was acquired. The calcium score was 1,200, but we still could assess the coronaries. And there is a method called CTFFR that we measure the flow across the arteries along with just like invasive FFR, but it's, it's an estimate of it. The estimate in the ramus was abnormal, even on the cath, ramus has disease, but this patient was medically managed because it was a small lesion, and basically we could assess the coronaries. This patient did not need a cath prior to undergoing, she ended up getting a cath uh, to compare, but in future, you could ask a question, can you medically manage? I think there is studies going on with that for complete uh, TAVR. This is an example of how we get CTFFR on these patients, and we used it, this during our VAL team meeting. We show this data and we make a case whether if the patient has a smaller vessel distal lesion based on the current data, would you treat them medically? And this is a the next case, oops, sorry. One second here. This is a case where there is a patient who basically has three vessel disease but has prox LAD stenosis with a CT FFR that's abnormal. And even on the cath, you can see they had a diagnostic cath that showed the same disease. There are two sequential lesions in a LAD. And you could assess the coronary anatomy despite high calcium score on the CT. And both patients got nitro. We give one dose of nitroglycerin, and this is the case that had, was revascularized, pa patient got TAVR, and after that got PCI of proximal LAD. So these are, not everybody can get, can we assess coronary on uh, TAVR CT. These are the exclusion criteria, critical stenosis we don't give, renal failure uh, with GFRs, chronic kidney disease less than 30 we don't, recent event with myocardial infarction or heart failure admi admissions, we don't. I don't have to read the list, but these are the kind of the patients that we don't assess coronaries, but majority we can. Especially low risk patients that we are doing now, you should be able to assess coronaries on a re regular basis. The last, I think that this probably is the most important aspect that we do on TAVR planning using CTA. Since it's such a good anatomic test, you can assess not only the cardiac morphology, but you can assess the planning, yeah. access for TAVR, annular sizing, uh, sinus dimension, burden of calcification, and prediction of implantation uh, angle. The data set that we acquire uh, used to have a lot of radiation before, but the current generation scanners, you can acquire this data set with very less radiation. And these are the kind of reconstruction images we do. We measure the annulus, we measure sinus dimensions, sinotubular junction, me burden of calcification on that um, uh, movie that you're seeing. The CT was never a great tool in the past for temporal resolution, assessing the uh, valve motion, but the current generation scanners, it's very good. We could assess the coronaries on the same patient. This patient's calcium score was 2,000. I'm going over time here, I think. I'll finish up. Okay. And you can see that transfemoral axis can be assessed, too. If there is an alternate axis, you can assess that to subclavian, transcable, or transcarotid. And these are the kind of measurements we do using our software, uh, transfemoral axis. If anybody was interested in the depth of planning TAVR, they can read the consensus document that kind of gives how to kind of measure TAVR measurements, and we certainly train people here to do that.